in his brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and calls me there with his hand and calls me there with his hand. Come on, Pat. I know you want to leave one. Come on. Joe David, I love you, bro. <laughs> if you guys won't mind, and I know you don't by now, uh, just grab one of those hymn books. Uh, if you're in the front, it's going to be uh, like underneath you. And if there is a pew in front of you, it's right ahead of you. Grab one of those hymn books and open to hymn number 464. 464. Four six four. We've we've had several several accents that would have spoken at this podium this morning. So by by now your your hearing is supposed to be in tune with all of these accents that you would have heard. South, deep south, deeper south. I mean. <laughs> oh. But we're not going to rush this song, nor are we going to like speed it up. We want to find that sweet spot and just, just, just groove to this song as, as best as you can. Uh, try and sing it with as, as, as much soul. That's, that's the term, right? As much soul as you can. So you might have to bob and weave while you, <laughs> while you sing this song. Uh, and let's just enjoy while we sing it. I don't know which verse to cut out, so we may not cut any verse, so let's go. God sent his son, they call him Jesus, he came to Sure. 
This child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because You may have your seats. Some of you watch me like we need a next one, but uh, I, I won't give in to that. I want to bring you back this morning into the book of Matthew chapter 25. And, and we, we are, if you didn't uh, already know it, we are continuing in our series, What's in Your Hand? Uh, and we've really been spending some time these last uh, couple of weeks or so on uh, developing this idea of, of giftedness and, and resources and using those within the confines of the mission that God has given to each and every single one of us. Uh, and on the last week, we began looking specifically at Matthew chapter 25, and, and we really spent some time there looking at the parable that Jesus 
would have spoken of concerning the, the three servants that were given uh, different quantities of talents. One servant was given five talents, another servant was given two talents, and of course the last servant uh, in this particular parable was given one talent. And so we saw in that particular text that the two first uh, uh, servants that came, the one who received five and the one who received two talents, they, they went out as soon as the master would have left. And uh, the scripture tells us Jesus, as he gives the parable, they went out and uh, they used, they invested, they, they, they took what was given to them and ultimately what was received was uh, multiplied. And so when the master came back and he reckoned with them, the one who received five talents came and he said to his master, Lord, you gave me five talents. See, I have been able to raise five more talents. The one who, who was given two talents said, Lord, you had given me two talents. And so see, I have been able to uh, raise two more talents. Here is what is yours. But the one who had received one talent, he uh, went and he hid his talent in the dirt. And so when his master came, he came and he said, Lord, try to butter up the master, of course. Lord, I, I knew you, you were a hard man. You reap where you don't sow and you, you gather where you have not scattered. And so uh, I hid your talent. I hid this talent because I was afraid of losing it. And his master had some really harsh things to say in, in, in contrast to what the master said concerning the first two servants, the, the master had some really harsh things to say concerning this particular servant. The master would have called him wicked and lazy. And so really, as we develop this text a little bit more, Jesus, as he uh, transitions into the last part, at least as Luke, rec Matthew records, sorry, as Jesus transitions into this last portion of uh, his dialogue, his discourse in chapter 25, it comes off of the heels of what he would have said in chap earlier in chapter 25 with regard to the parable of the ten virgins and now this parable of the servants and the talents. Now at the end of chapter 25, he, he paints a scene of a throne room where there's a, a large gathering in the presence of this king, in the presence of this Lord. And I want us to note some things as we think for a subject, a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. A heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Allow me to just do some diligence in sharing with you some, some really uh, important things as we look at getting into this particular text. The lesson of Matthew 25 are some very sobering, sobering ones. As Matthew records Jesus' parabolic teaching concerning the kingdom, we have to recognize that this is not the first time that uh, the kingdom has been alluded to throughout the confines of Matthew's gospel. As a matter of fact, Matthew has been developing this theme from the very onset of his particular gospel account. In chapter 3, for example, and verse number 2, he, he speaks and he writes concerning uh, the speech that John would have had in his ministry when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus takes up his ministry, Jesus echoes the same sentiments that, that Matthew develops in chapter 4 and verse number 17 as he repeats, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew further uh, develops this theme of kingdom or kingdom living and kingdom ideals as he picks up Jesus' discourse, one of Jesus' lengthiest discourse that Matthew records, and there are about three or four throughout the confines of his gospel account. But in chapters 5 of Matthew through 7, where we associate as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes occasion, as Matthew records, to teach on kingdom character, kingdom practices, and kingdom ideals. I'm just trying to help us to recognize that, that Matthew would have been developing this idea and this theme about kingdom throughout the confines of his gospel account. You get to chapter 10 and verse 7, for example, as Jesus is preparing to send his disciples out for the very first time, he also tells them, as you go, this is chapter 10 and verse number 7, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom 
is at hand. In chapter 16 and verse number 19, as, as he is passing through the coast of Caesarea Philippi, it's, it's a particular uh, account that, that we are all well familiar with, but in verse number 19, Jesus says to Peter in a declaration, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. So kingdom, as far as this idea, kingdom, as far as this theme, is mentioned in every chapter of the book of Matthew with the exceptions of chapters 1, 2, 14, 15, 17, 27, and 28. Needless to say, seven out of the 28 chapters do not use the word specifically kingdom. But we can conclude as we look at the totality and the volume of the amount of times that kingdom is presented throughout the book and the writing of Matthew, that even though these chapters don't mention or speak specifically to anything pertaining to the kingdom, they do in fact reflect on kingdom ideals and teaching. So as we think about where we are in the book of Matthew chapter 25, I want us to recognize that Jesus shares two clear parables before closing his dialogue with a very vivid throne room scene. Jesus combines what the disciples is expected to do prior to his return in Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 30. And then later on, he, uh, what the disciples should expect when he does return in our text in verse 31 through verse 46. So prior to Jesus' return, I want us to notice these two things. If you are taking notes, I'm told you we're going to do some diligence first before we get into the text. So prior to his return, I want us to know two things. Number one, the disciple ought to be preparing while watching. Say preparing, preparing. while watching. That's really to say that Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand that, that they need to be foolproofing. Yes, you heard right. Fool proofing. All right, you guys with me? Say fool. fool. Not the way you think it. Say fool. Fool proofing. So when you think about what he does in the first parable, the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five of whom were foolish, he is teaching his disciples that they need to be fool proofing themselves. In the second parable, however, the parable that he deals with the talents, in the parable that he talks about these, these three servants, he is teaching his disciples to be active, say active, and working. So in the first parable, he was trying to help them to understand what it means to be foolproofing. In the second parable, he's trying to help them to understand what it means to be fearproofing. Say fearproofing. So number one, he says, I need for you to become foolproof. <laughs> In the second instance, he says, I need for you to become fearproof. But on your way to becoming foolproof and ultimately becoming fearproof, I'm really preparing you to become fireproof. <laughs> you, 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 I hope you guys don't miss it. Because the, the, the only time you can really become fireproof, that's the scene where we are. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 36. He wants them to understand what it means to be fireproof. But before you can become fireproof, you have to become fearproof. And you also have to become foolproof. It's, it's going to be rocky in just a little bit. So in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 36, and I really want to try and be diligent, we have a scene here that is presented as Jesus closes off his dialogue. It's my firm belief that he's trying to give his disciples, it's my firm belief that Matthew is utilizing this particular dialogue at this particular time in this particular account that he has put together. It's my firm belief that Jesus' is teaching here has relevance to us even on today. I said on last week that I know that there are some people who believe that this text has nothing to do with us today, that this text had only to do with the, uh, with the events that would have occurred on, on AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem. But I believe wholeheartedly that this text has a whole lot to do with us today as we prepare ourselves for the inevitability of our Lord and Savior's return. And so in this particular account in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46, there are some details 
that I want us to take note. And, and this particular account, I must say, is really a good summary of all of the things that Jesus would have ultimately taught in the previous two parables. But here it is, he elaborates a little bit more in not just showcasing the, 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 the reward for those who would have done well, and not just showcasing again the reward for those who have not done well, but I think he does give a good picture as to not just what they were supposed to do, but what they were supposed to expect as they look forward to the master's return. So as we look at some of the details, let me do this really quickly. We see that the Son of Man has come in his glory and the, all the angels with him. All nations are to be gathered in his presence and before him there shall be a separation. The, the terminology is as a shepherd would divide the sheep from the goats. And I don't have enough time to even elaborate on what all the implications of, 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 of that would be. But the whole idea, the simplistic idea, not to be over simplistic, but the whole idea is that there is going to be a separation of individuals. As a, mass, as, a, as a shepherd would divide the sheep from the goats, I, I just want to use that language because I don't want to delve into that too much, but I want us to see that in as much as everyone was gathered before the throne, there is going to come a point where there is going to be a separation of sorts. Those on the master's right would be accounted as sheep, and those on the master's left would be accounted as goats. And like I said before, we could delve into that a little bit more, but I just want us to see that there is a separation that is going to take place. But as we go a little bit further, it says reward, reward is given to those who are counted as sheep, as well as a reward is given to those who are accounted as goats. But what I want us to look at really briefly and really quickly is, is what exactly afforded these individuals who were on the right hand who were accounted as sheep, what really afforded them this opportunity to be blessed by the king, to be blessed by the one on the throne? Notice if you look down in verse number 35, and this is a real familiar text to us, so I, I know I'm just speaking to the choir here, but, but look down at, at verse number 35 of chapter 25. After the, the king, after the, the master says, uh, come uh, on, on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice in verse number 35 some really specific things. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I want you to note this. I, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and... You came unto me. And so there are some really specific things here that Jesus sort of highlights in this final picture that as a result of doing, these individuals would have been blessed by the master to have received not just a good commendation, but ultimately if you look down to verse number 46, their, their, their blessing was eternal life. So... There are some things that Jesus points out via this, 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 this scene that was done by these individuals who are accounted in the text as righteous. There are some things that they would have done that would have afforded them the opportunity to have received eternal life. Stick with me on this. Whereas later on in the text, there are some things that the unrighteous, failed to do or, 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 or failed to participate in that afforded them the opportunity to end up in a place that was, wasn't even prepared for the human soul. Jesus would say that this place was prepared for the devil and his angels. And so on one hand, we, we have those individuals who would have done some things, and on the other hand, we have those individuals who would have abstained from some things, both received reward based on what they would or would not have done. But here's what I want us to appreciate in this particular text. When this master, when this king reiterates the statement for, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. 
I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. I, I, I want you to notice that the, 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 the king here, he puts himself in the position as the one to whom the deed was done. And that's going to be vital as we transition into the text a little bit more. So those who were hungry, those who were thirsty, those who were strangers, those who were naked, those who were sick, and those who were in prison were attended to. And as a result, they were blessed with ultimately eternal life. But I want us also to notice the response of the righteous. Follow me on this. Because in as much as this king personalizes these deeds that were done to others as if it were done to himself, equally interestingly enough is the response of the righteous as they question the king as to when exactly was this done unto him. They did these deeds maybe and they thought that they were doing it unto their fellow man. They did these deeds and they thought that they were doing it to a fellow human being. They did not see their master and so they are baffled in questioning the master. When saw we thee hungry or when saw we thee thirsty? When saw we thee a stranger? When saw we thee naked? When saw we thee sick? We didn't see you master. We didn't see you king. We may have done these deeds but we didn't think we were doing it unto you. But the master would conclude in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, don't miss that. You have done it on to me. In other words, as we look at this particular incident, in so much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, he says, you have done it mm, unto me. Note the focus should not be on just doing good deeds so we can get the reward. Rather, we are to be developing such a godly thinking and character that we just find ourselves living and doing the things that reflect the master which we serve. So that is not to say that as we look at this particular text, that all of a sudden we should find ourselves busy of doing good deeds and feeding the poor and, and putting clothes on people who don't have. We shouldn't find ourselves just doing these deeds that we find in Matthew 25 simply because our reward is attached to it. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus is, is ultimately saying. And, and ultimately, you would notice when they asked the question, when saw we the hungry? When saw we the thirsty? They were already doing the deeds. They weren't doing it necessarily for a reward, but they have come to recognize in this confrontation that because they were living, because they were exercising, because they were taking care of their fellow man in the true sense of the two, it was met ultimately with a reward. So I believe what Jesus is trying to help these individuals and trying to help us to recognize is that we ought not to be finding ourselves doing good deeds, thinking that if we just do the good deeds, ultimately heaven will be our reward. But the good deeds ought to come as a reflection of the character and the thinking and the mentality and the godly spirit that has been generated inside of us. My grandmother always used to say, if, if you take somebody that loves to sing and you put them on a stage, guess what they will do? Come on, talk to me. If you take somebody that loves to bake and you put them in a kitchen, guess what they will do? If you take somebody that loves numbers and, account, and, and, and accounting and, and, and being diligent that way and you, you put them with a book and a letter, guess what they will do? They'll put your books together. You take somebody that loves to work with their hands and you give them, uh, uh, you know, some wood and some nails, a saw and a hammer, uh, and they'll build something. I'm trying to help us to understand that it's, 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 it's innate in us that sometimes based on who we are and our characters uh, 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 and our spirit, it just oozes from time to time. If you are the type of person that's, that's filled with joy and you are the type of person that, that's filled with love, it doesn't matter what the world around you is doing. That thing will ooze out no matter what you... If you are the type of person that loves people, it doesn't matter what people say about you. You will love them even as they hate you. That thing just oozes out. You don't have to try it. You don't have to be pushed to do it. You just do it because that's who you are. 
So when you think about what Jesus is trying to help these individuals to understand, he's trying to help them to understand as Matthew would have taken the opportunity to develop these kingdom ideals from the very beginning of the book up until Jesus' dialogue, he's trying to help them to understand that kingdom people exude kingdom characteristics. So as a person, as a person who is a follower of Jesus Christ, Knowing full well the master and the God that we serve, we can't help but portray the attitude and the characteristics of the master to whom we submit. Here is what Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. Let me repeat that one more time. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let me repeat that one more time so, so some of you could mumble that with me. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let me show you now what that looks like and what that means. The light that is, that is shining is yours, but it doesn't really come from you. The source is God. The source of that light is God. And what is portrayed ultimately comes from you, the vessel. But really the source is from God. If you take the source away, then you don't have the capacity to illuminate in the same type of way that, the same type of way that if the source was there. So let your light so shine. It's you are the one that's doing it. It's you are the one that's shining. But the thing you are shining is the character, the heart, and the attitude of Almighty God. So because you are a conduit, you can't help but exude love. Because you are a conduit, you can't help but exude forgiveness. Because you are a conduit, you can't help but exude self-sacrifice. Because you are a conduit, you can't help but exude submissiveness. You guys get in this? So the thing that I display, I display it as if it's me, but it's not really me. It's the God who is shining in me. So he says, let your light so shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. But who gets the glory? It's God. So I'm not even doing it to get glory. That's a man-made construct. A man-made man thinking would say, I do it so that I could get the glory. But someone who has subjected themselves to the goodness of God, someone who has developed a godly character understands it's not about, it's not about me. Because I couldn't shine this type of light even if I wanted to. On my best day, I couldn't love the way that Christ loved on my best day. I can serve the way Christ served. So it's not really about, it's not about me. I'm just the conduit. So he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. In other words, by truly becoming kingdom people, the actions and deeds mentioned become so much of a norm that we no longer pay it any mind and it becomes second nature to us. You may have to be intentional as you start off doing some of these things, but as you and I become more and more transformed by the heart of Christ, by the mind of Christ, by the, th the teachings of Christ, as we become more and more like Christ, it goes from being us having to become intentional about it having plans to do it, to us actually being the very thing that we're doing. So when we become true kingdom people, the actions and deeds mentioned become not so much as a norm. We no longer pay much mind to it, but it becomes second nature. If you're taking notes, take this down. We, we just find ourselves truly being ourselves. You don't have to force it. You don't have to push it. You don't have to prod it. You don't even have to fake it. Anybody ever heard the statement, fake it to make it? Sometimes that's true, right? You, you, you know, I'm not really a happy person, but people tell you if you smile a little bit more, it becomes you. 
You know, I don't know if... <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to fake it to get in the, in the, in, in the right frame of mind to find yourself practicing it. it, it you know, you, you take those steps. Well, I need to do it. I, I need to do it. I need to do it. I need to do it. Until eventually you just do it. Anybody here grew up loving... Love, like literally love to get up every, every day and reading your Bible? I would guess not. As grown as we are, sometimes we forget to pray. You know, these are all things that become part of the Christian attitude, thinking, and lifestyle. But as you go deeper and deeper in your relationship with God, the thing that may have been hard at one point, you, you know, it becomes a delight to you. Uh, when I was growing up, there was a point when, when you know, my parents had, my grandparents had to kind of push me out of the house to come to church services. Now you don't have to push me. Now I come, it doesn't matter. It could be, as long as those doors are open, right? As long as those doors are open, it, it could be hail, it could be rain, it could be, it could be flood. As long as those doors are open and I can make it, I'm here. As long as there is life in the body, as long as I have a voice, I'll sing. As long as there is life in the body, I have good health and strength, I'll come and shake hands and I'll give hugs and I'll do, I'll do diligence to try and fellowship and encourage every single person that I come into contact with. That's because it's no longer, it's no longer me trying to be intentional and trying to do it as a discipline, but it, it has become part of who I am. As a matter of fact, if, if for some reason my, my throat becomes sore and I can't sing, I, can't sing, I become sick. If, if for some reason I, I, I'm not in service on Sunday or, or su Sunday morning or evening, I, I just don't feel, I just don't feel right. If this is going to sound a little bit crass, but anybody ever forget to brush their teeth in the morning? <laughs> I, I could tell you. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel right. You go for a couple of days without brushing your teeth. Thank God we have masks now. <laughs> but if you... When the godly character becomes who you are, to not engage in godly acts doesn't feel right. So Jesus is is speaking here concerning these individuals who they had such a godly character that as they did these deeds, they didn't even know what was the reward behind it. But now they are faced with the king, and the king says, because you would have done these things, you, you were doing it to these people, but you were really doing it unto me. And so they, they weren't doing it to make heaven their home. They weren't doing it thinking that they would receive anything in return other than this is what we are supposed to do based on being kingdom people. And as a result, they were blessed. They were blessed with eternal life. I want to just look at these three passages and we'll close. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm right. These, these three passages and we'll close. I want us to look first and foremost at the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Then secondly, we'll make our way into the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse number 16. And then finally, we will conclude in the book of James, chapter 2, verse number 14 through 26. So we look at Ephesians, chapter 2, if you're taking notes. I'm just repeating this one more time. Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Then we'll go on to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse number 16. And then we'll look at this final text in the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. You guys okay? All right. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10 will sound something like this. And I'm reading this from the King James Version. For by grace, say grace, grace. are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Let me repeat that one more time. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Church, what, were we, what are we as Christians created unto? Come on, say it with some feeling. What, what are we created unto? Good works. good works. Which God had before ordained. That, that word ordained there also gives the implication of the word appointed. That we should walk in what? Yeah, it, it is, it's the same thing. Walk in what? Good works. Say good works. So we were created in Christ unto good works. And he says, by the same token, we ought to walk by and in. Come on, say it with me. We were created in Christ unto good works. And we should walk by or therein good works. In other words, when we were created in Christ, when you and I became Christians, a huge part of that was to find ourselves in service. That's all good works really mean. It means Service. Say service. service. I, I know I have an accent. But then notice what he says. We were created on two good works, but we ought to also walk by or walk in. In other words, when we live, we live a life of service. So don't think good works simply as you just giving somebody food. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. But think of all of that representative of falling under the category of service. So we were created in Christ unto service, and we ought as Christians to live by and walk in service. You guys with me? I'm going to take my time and go through this. Come now to the book of Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 16, because here's the trouble. The trouble is, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 16, the trouble is sometimes we, we don't really appreciate what Paul is doing when he talks about works in some, in some of his letters. In a lot of Paul's letters, the book of Romans, for example, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Philippians, oftentimes when he refers to works, he is making a contrast between uh, the works of the law or uh, being under the law of Moses as opposed to being justified by faith. However, within the confines of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he is not only, and I, 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 I believe this to be true, he is not only bringing into view works of the law, but he is bringing into view any type of work that man thinks that he or she could do in order to make heaven their home. In other words, we can't work in order to gain heaven. You guys with me? We shouldn't be doing deeds just to think that by doing deeds we'll be saved. But we are saved... And as a result of the character that we have and the heart that we are supposed to reflect, as a result of that, we find ourselves working. So we don't work to be saved. No, we are saved, and as a result, we work. We don't work, church, in order to be saved. But because we are saved, we work. Some, some people told me, well, sometimes when you make a statement, it, you need to give people some time to, for you to settle, and then they could say amen. So let me repeat it one more time. We, 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 we don't work in order to be saved. Because we are saved, we work. Amen. All right. All right. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 16. So again, I said in Ephesians chapter number 2, I, I, I believe that when Paul is talking about works, there, he's not only bringing into view the works of the law, but he's bringing into any type of work that man could find himself doing. So we can't work to gain our salvation, but rather it's a gift of God by grace. But because we are saved and because of the calling that we have in Christ, we find ourselves working. In Galatians 2 and verse number 16, here's what it would say. I'm reading from the King James Version again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even he, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no, no flesh be justified. You can't work for salvation. Come with me now as we close into the book of James chapter number 2. James chapter number 2. Yes, you heard right. We are about to close. James chapter number 2. James chapter 2. Make your way down to verse number 14. And I want to peruse the, this text. Uh, from verse 14 all the way through verse number 26. Joe David, make your way up, bro. 
sit, sit on this throne up here. In James chapter 2 and verse number 14, if you're in James chapter 2, verse 14, say amen. amen. All right. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? That's rhetorical. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say to them, which many people have said in, in the past and currently in the present and probably will say in the future, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. In other words, rather than giving them something to eat and taking care of their physical needs, you, you impart, God bless you and keep you with a hand raised high to the sky. Joe David, you're hungry, but God bless you. You will receive food. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the thing that is needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You guys there? But some of you may say, you, you have faith and I have works. Show me, he says, your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith. By, in other words, you could claim to have faith all you want if it's not accompanied by deeds, if it's not accompanied by godly living. That faith, he says, is dead. But I don't even have to proclaim to you I have faith. I just need to show you. You just need to look at my life. So the old adage goes, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one preach. I, I'm not saying not to tell somebody you are Christian. I'm, I'm saying show somebody you're a Christian. I'm not saying just post that you're a Christian. Just post you have love. Just post about the goodness of God. Show people what the goodness of God looks like. When people look at the world, this world that is going down dark in a place of hatred, dark in a place of sin, they ought to look at a Christian and realize that person is different. Why is that? Because the light that's coming from them is not their own. It's a godly light. So let me do this and I'm done. Notice, come down if you would. Come down if you would to verse number 20 and 21 and I'll, I'll, I'll step out of the way. In verse number 20 it says, but do you... Do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That's James by spirit trying to get these people foolproof. You become foolproof by understanding that your faith ought to be accompanied by godly living. 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? In the example of Abraham, that's James by the Spirit saying, you need to be fear proof. If Abraham at the time was filled with fear, he would not have sacrificed Isaac his son. So we need to be foolproof. Say foolproof. We need to be fearproof. Say fearproof. But all the while, all the while, God is saying, what I really want you to be is fireproof. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Hear my conclusion. Hungry, say hungry. hungry. Thirsty, say thirsty. thirsty. Stranger. Stranger. Naked. Naked. Sick. Sick. In prison. In prison. All of these are physical realities. However, here's the flip side. However, I don't believe Jesus is only speaking about a physical reality of people. He is saying we need to find ourselves participating in these activities. But this is a type of double entendre type of scene. Because every single one of those terms are also references to the spiritual well-being of human beings. 
People who are hungry for the word. People who are thirsty for the word. People who are naked without the clothing of Christ. People who are sick in sin. People who are imprisoned to the devil. These are terms, though physical, these are also spiritual implication type terms. So he says, I need for you to take care of the physical, but beyond the physical, what I really want you to take care of is the spiritual. So hear me while I say this, church. We might find ourselves having programs and doing stuff. Don't let the focus be taking care of the physical needs. Let the focus be the spiritual need while taking care of the physical need. Because we have a heaven to gain and a hell to share. Our shepherds are positioned in the front of the auditorium. If you have something to celebrate, if you have something to uh, pray over, uh, whatever the need, um, they are here at your disposal. So take advantage of that opportunity. Let's sing while we are praying. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my by strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still with striving sea, my comforter. Thank you. 